You know, most kids hope for a car for their 16th birthday, not a country. They're not just like us. So why do films and TV shows insist on making them feel like they are? Film and TV are full of examples of the relatable royal. Everyone leaves me. Dies. And if we look closer, we can see some common story devices these narratives use to move us to empathize with these grand rulers. Royal responsibility is thrust onto them. I can't be a King Archimedes. I don't know anything about ruling a country. We often meet the relatable royal at an early stage, when they're reluctant or unprepared to take on the mantle of ruling. Thus, taking power might require a noble sacrifice in the name of duty. We have all made sacrifices and suppressed who we are. It is not a choice. It is a duty. We watch them go through a sympathetic personal crisis. <laughs> I'm not a king. They break the class barrier, engaging in relationships with people outside of the trappings of monarchy or lower than their social status. I've never been alone with a man before, even with my dress on. They're funny. It must be an enormous responsibility and honor to lead a country of such import. It's actually not that hard. Ultimately, they're shown to be normal, enjoying and longing for the same kind of things that drive their subjects, even if their real-life equivalents had a reputation for being anything but. It's not too much, is it? No. Here's our take on the relatable royal and the con of convincing us commoners that the royals are really no different from the rest of us. People like you don't get to insult people like me. You get to be eternally grateful. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community where millions of people come together to take classes that fuel their creative journey. If you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below, you'll get two free months of Skillshare Premium. So become a member today and start exploring your creativity for less than $10 a month. Storytelling about royals has long served as emotional propaganda, making audiences sympathize with, look up to, and trust in the people who rule over them. In the 1500s and 1600s, Shakespeare's history plays dramatized the larger-than-life clashes and sometimes villainy of the earlier medieval British royal lines. I'd seem a saint when most I play the devil. But even when he was discrediting past kings to win favor with the Tudor rulers of his own times, Shakespeare's writing gave such complexity to his characters that it couldn't help but humanize the monarchy. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Centuries later, film would carry on this tradition. According to Victoria Duckett, the emergence of cinema as an art form in Europe coincided with a reappraisal of Queen Elizabeth I. Previously viewed as a cruel and cold leader, she began to be seen as a more sympathetic figure. As a queen, yes. But as a woman, do I mean nothing to you? Nothing. Early films about royals were mutually beneficial for the royal image and for the glamour of the cinematic medium. Movie stars were implicitly elevated to the status of kings and queens, while audiences got the chance to experience royals as living, breathing, empathetic individuals like us. In the evolution of on-screen royals ever since, we can identify a few different types of relatable royal. Most relatable of all is the Cinderella royal a commoner like us who gets to become royal. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. Crucially, this story makes royals accessible by showing the barrier between them and us to be navigable. The prince shall choose a bride. With 1950s Cinderella and later films about women marrying into royalty, Disney solidified this narrative in our culture. Do people assume all your problems got solved because a big strong man showed up? Yes! What is up with that? She, she is, is a princess. princess! And in its Disney form, this rags-to-riches narrative portrays royal status as a fitting reward for a truly deserving or virtuous person. But Cinderella stories have been told for millennia. Over 2,000 years ago, Greek historian Strabo recorded the story of Rhodopis about a Greek slave girl who marries the king of Egypt. 
Usually, this story is about becoming a royal through marriage. And with some exceptions, the marrying a royal fantasy tends to center on a woman. Because for much of history, marriage has represented many women's sole opportunity for upward social mobility. But I would feel like a king if you would be my wife. If the Cinderella royal isn't marrying up, they might be discovering they have royal blood. Me? A, a princess? Shut up! My duties are mostly for show, right? I mean, I hope you're not counting on me to solve any large national problems. On their most obvious level, these stories offer the light-hearted wish fulfillment of what it might be like to suddenly discover that you are a lot more special and important in the world's eyes than anybody suspected. You are Lindy Smith? Yes, sir. Your obedient subjects. They're also full of silly humor that demystifies royal institutions, pointing out how they can be ridiculous, stuffy, and improved by an infusion of new energy. You're not mad at me for what happened? Actually, I found it rather funny. It reminds me of my first royal dinner party. Ultimately, the Cinderella narrative presents becoming an elite as something that even the most unlikely candidates can learn and adapt to. I had every intention of giving up my claim to the throne. But then I thought, if I cared about the other seven billion out there instead of just me, that's probably a much better use of my time. But even these stories acknowledge that climbing the social ladder will not be easy. A 2013 paper suggested that people who see themselves as upper class are more likely than the lower classes to believe that social class is inherent, stable, and biologically determined. In other words, just because you move up in the world, that doesn't mean you will be welcomed by those already at the top. Do you ever do any fencing? Just a little when I was a kid. A couple watches here and there. While The Princess Diaries provides teen girls the fantasy of being rescued from their ugly duckling woes by a magical swan life waiting for them, the film also highlights how fake the people pretending to be Mia's friends actually are, and how difficult it is to lead a normal teenage life under her circumstances. Hey, it's Mia Thermopolis. Can you autograph your picture for me? Josh did. Hey, there's Princess Pucker up. Still, the Cinderella royal narrative remains so appealing because, as far-fetched as some renditions may be, it just could happen. And occasionally, a version of it does come true in real life. American Grace Kelly gave up being one of the biggest movie stars in the world to marry Prince Rainier III of Monaco. And Prince Rainier's bride is no longer Grace Kelly, but Her Serene Highness Princess Grace of Monaco. More recently, both Kate Middleton's marriage to Prince William and Meghan Markle's marriage to Prince Harry were widely described in Cinderella terms. It's the stuff of fairy tales, the royal wedding of Harry and Meghan. Yet while these stories help bolster the enduring appeal of the Cinderella narrative, the reality is often not as much of a fairy tale. It's really been a struggle. Yes. A second major category of relatable monarch stories is the reluctant royal, a character who, at first, really doesn't want to wear the crown. Your father, His Majesty King Henry, is ill. He requests your presence. I suggest you return to the palace directly and tell him his request was wholly ignored. When you look at all that being a royal entails, many of us might not find it all that appealing. Now, it's not a fairy tale. It's real life in there. Well, so to speak, they, it's think, real life they in there. think it's real life in there. There is the media scrutiny, having to give up your old life, the weight of responsibility for subjects who may not always approve of you, and having everything you do subject to approval by a rigidly traditional staff. Nine o'clock, we leave for the Polinari Automotive Works, where you'll be presented with a small car. Thank you. Which you will not accept. No, thank you. However, in the reluctant royal narrative, this character, who would prefer not to have the burden of ruling, usually ends up embracing the role and being shown to be the perfect person for the job. I knew you'd be good. The King's Speech presents King George VI's ascent to the throne as a grueling, painful, often embarrassing sacrifice. Bertie has to take on this unwanted duty because his older brother David has chosen love, marrying a divorcee, Wallace Simpson, over his own responsibility. This King and Lang of eating a staff and buying more pearls for Wallace while people are marching across Europe Stop singing the worry. red flag. Bertie's reluctance is interwoven with his struggle to overcome a debilitating stutter. And the 
physical act of learning to speak is used as a metaphor to represent Bertie's journey toward finding the voice of the monarchy. Why should I waste my time listening? Because I have a right to be, and I have a voice! At a time when his country needs its guiding presence more than ever. But I now call my people at home and my people across the seas. The Crown also sets up Queen Elizabeth II's rise to power as a sacrifice, and similarly emphasizes the pull between duty and one's own desires. The two Elizabeths will frequently be in conflict with one another. The fact is, the Crown must win. While Elizabeth's sister Margaret and her uncle David, the same former king we watched abdicate in the King's Speech, put love first and cherish their individual wills, Elizabeth ultimately serves the crown above all, repeatedly having to displease or hurt those she loves and set aside her own feelings and even her sense of self when the office demands this of her. Might I suggest not being head of the church for a minute, or head of state, or head of the Commonwealth of Nations, or the army, or the navy, or the government. And when she ends up making difficult, unpopular decisions because she believes they serve the integrity and reputation of the crown, the downside to her personal life makes her actions feel selfless and noble. Even if, outside of the story's framing, we might find some of these actions cold or unfair. I cannot allow you to marry Peter and remain part of this family. That is my decision. In defiance of the pledge you made to our father. In Coming to America's comic version of this trope, Prince Akeem's reluctance toward his royal life stems from an understanding that his pampered existence is lacking depth. Life! Real life! A thing that we have been denied for far too long. Even if, in the end, Akeem doesn't have to give up either the throne or true love, he's willing to forego all that wealth and power in order to find an equal life partner who challenges him to be a more worthy person. I want a woman that's going to arouse my intellect as well as my loins. So this reluctance, his deeper intuition that there must be more to life and ruling than just being worshipped, is the making of a superior king and ultimately enables him to have his cake and eat it too. Would you really have given up all of this just for me? Of course. If you like, we can give it all up now. Nah. The royal who initially resists being king or queen aligns with the refusal of the Call of Adventure stage in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Simba, if you don't do something soon, everyone will starve. I can't go back. Why? You wouldn't understand. By refusing the call to become a ruler, the reluctant royal proves they're exactly the kind of person we want to be in charge, precisely because they don't proactively seek power. As Douglas Adams, the restaurant at the end of the universe puts it, it is a well-known fact that those people who must want to rule people are, ipso facto, those least suited to do it. Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should on no account be allowed to do the job. As 13th in line in my own kingdom, I didn't stand a chance. I knew I'd have to marry into the throne somewhere. The flip side to the reluctant royal is the royal rebel, who's unwilling to bend their whole identity to the monarchy's traditions. We're going out. Incognito. Does the tiara rather give the game away, man? Unlike the reluctant royal, the royal rebel may be drawn to the idea of ruling and its grandeur. I don't think I can do it. I could. To be on every coin, on every banknote, to be the most famous woman in the world, I'd be so very good at it. This character is often more glamorous, charismatic, or exciting on the surface than the reluctant royal. A natural number one whose tragedy it is to have been born number two. They defy the rules about being a ruler and might represent an important challenge to the stifling old ways. However, while the reluctant royal ends up being unexpectedly well-suited for their role, the rebel is inevitably destroyed by its confines. Margaret does suffer more than anyone else by not having a more meaningful role. And in terms of ability and character and intelligence and flair, she does not deserve to be overlooked. The royal rebel is arguably the persona the public is most attracted to, and the one we know most about, due to their tendency to attract public controversy. Three of the real-life women who've inspired some of the most frenzied, over-the-top media coverage in the history of the modern British monarchy, Princess Margaret, Princess Diana, and Meghan Markle, have all been painted in the context of this narrative. Because I do things differently. Because I don't go by a rule book. Because... I lead from the heart, not the head. 
But The Crown illustrates how the Princess Margaret of modern memory, who became perfect tabloid fodder, hard drinking, partying, chain smoking, has this this string of tragic affairs began as a sensitive romantic whose desire for real love was crushed by her cold, cynical palace environment. You've been against this from the beginning. Because you can't bear to be eclipsed. What? You can't bear to be outshone by your younger sister. Similarly, Elizabeth's firstborn son, Charles, is viewed sympathetically as a royal misfit who's punished by his family for committing the sin of having too much personality. Do I have a voice? Rather too much of a voice for my liking. Let me let you into a secret. No one wants to hear it. Fictional takes on rebellious royals often capitalize on our tabloid fascination with the monarchy through a larger-than-life tone that, at times, even resembles scandalous fan fiction. My husband announced he wants to abolish the only life I've ever known. And his footman nearly saw my... Yet this public hunger for sensationalist royal stories dehumanizes the real people behind the headlines. But my British friend said to me, I'm sure he's great, but you shouldn't do it because the British tabloids will destroy your life. The often not so subtly racist media harassment that has plagued Meghan Markle, leading to Meghan's and Prince Harry's much publicized Megxit from the royal family, can't help but recall the role the paparazzi played in the death of Harry's mother, Diana. I've seen what happens when someone I love is commoditized to the point that they are no longer treated or seen as a real person. Ironically, part of the fascination with Meghan and Diana before her was that they began by representing the Cinderella narrative, both Mary into royalty and being seen to challenge the established order. And during her wedding, Princess Diana made history when she omitted the vow to obey Prince Charles. However, their treatment shows that, outside of fairy tale narratives, not towing the line frequently isn't welcomed in these rigid institutions. I don't think many people would want me to be queen. Actually, when I say many people, I mean the establishment that I'm married into. And lastly, we have the sympathetic tyrant, a ruler who may have done very bad things and be subject to a more critical lens from historians, but who's made sympathetic or appealing through a story that focuses on their human traits. Who has done more damage to the monarchy, me with my willfulness or you lot with your inhumanity. In a number of examples, the sympathetic tyrant portrayal doesn't gloss over the tyrant part, yet the lasting impression we're left with is still the humanity of this character, making us feel for someone whom it would likely be more rational to remember as an oppressor or a deeply flawed individual. The Crown does expose King Edward VIII's Nazi links in more depth than the King's speech. Hitler and his henchmen were once our friends. But it doesn't do this until the second season. And before and after, it also paints David as witty, charming, and magnanimous. Let us be united in grief on equal terms with someone we all loved. We see the other royals through his eyes. What a bunch of ice-veined monsters my family are. We're invited to question whether his family mistreated him after his abdication. I've never forgotten the way in which you defended me fought for me during that terrible time. No man should be punished for love. And he even gets the chance to explain and justify his misdeeds. Another grotesque war, millions more dead, when peace was all that mattered to me. In the show, he makes the claim that nobody could have predicted what Hitler would become. People forget there was no indication of who Hitler would become. In reality, he said in 1933, dictators are very popular these days. We might want one in England before long. King George III, though perhaps no worse than an average monarch of his period, commanded the military to attack the American colonists' ships, burn their towns, and even kidnap their sailors to prevent American independence. I've had no peace of mind since we lost America. But the most memorable modern depiction of him in The Madness of King George instead highlights the aging man's vulnerability as he suffers from mental illness. When felons were induced to talk, they were shown first the instruments of their torture. 
The king has shown the instrument of his. Poking fun at the royals can have a similar humanizing effect. I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. Da 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 da! Henry VIII, a fearsome king who beheaded two of his six wives, was turned into a comical glutton and lech by Charles Lawton in 1933's The Private Life of Henry VIII, making the figure less terrifying and more accessible. There's no delicacy nowadays. No consideration for others. More recently, the Tudors turned the figure, who in real life looked like this, into a young, sexy version who, despite his bad behavior, appealed to viewers through his many fun exploits with women. The Last Emperor paints Chinese Emperor Pu Yi as the victim of an outdated institution, building sympathy for the character by showing us the farce of his being taught to rule as a little baby. I'm not allowed to say what I mean. They're always telling me what to say. Sofia Coppola likewise turns historical villain Marie Antoinette into both a victim and a relatable feminist protagonist. Through her intentionally anachronistic tale of decadent adolescence, soundtracked by 80s New Wave, the gossiping can like ruin your life when you're in high school. So all the those feelings are in the movie and are totally relatable to now. Ironically, the long-held image of Marie Antoinette as an out-of-touch, big-spending monarch may also be as a result of propaganda and scapegoating. And had Coppola cleaved more directly to the real history, she could have gone even further in her attempts to make us sympathize with the real queen. She did, however, include very generous charitable contributions to the poor of France among her lavish spending, which also makes the idea of her saying, let them eat cake, seem out of character. Our popular image of Cleopatra II stems from Hollywoodization. Is the beautiful, beguiling Egyptian princess who had affairs with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony really the full story? The corridors are dark, gentlemen. But you mustn't be afraid. I am with you. Well, no, because the full story would have to include the fact that Cleopatra married both of her brothers, had a hand in their deaths, and ordered her sister's execution. Still, the romantic, sympathetic image of Cleopatra may be doing her a disservice, as historian Stacey Schiff argues that more accurate tellings would focus on how Cleopatra, who was actually Greek, not Egyptian, was a well-educated, great political strategist. Whoever controls the ports controls Egypt. Maybe the most important issue that many of these stories skip over or marginalize is the valid and widespread criticism of whether monarchies should still exist at all. The pressure group Republic has been campaigning for the abolition of the UK monarchy since 1983. Why have we had a head of state on, you know, in office? Uh, for more than 60 years without uh, any chance of accountability or change. So what purpose does making the royal relatable on screen actually serve in the 21st century? All that's happened on my watch is the place has fallen apart. It's only fallen apart if we say it has. That's the thing about the monarchy. We paper over the cracks. Arguably, even those most nuanced royal portrayals like The Crown, which do include plenty of criticism and contradictions... I'm a Republican nationalist. You know my feelings about the office of the Prince of Wales. It's a princehood illegitimately imposed upon us by oppressive imperial conquest. Still ultimately function as propaganda, making us feel for people who don't really need or deserve our sympathy. The last royal wedding for Prince William and Kate Middleton cost an estimated $34 million. Perhaps most mysteriously, Americans seem uniquely fascinated with royalty, even though they fought a war to free themselves from British rule. And in America, we can kind of have our cake and eat it too. You know what I mean? It's like we don't have to have any royals, we get to borrow the royals. As University of Texas Assistant Director of British Studies James Vaughn says, the fact Britain has this distinction between the head of government and a hereditary, non-powerful head of state who can't be sullied in the same way as the head of government by dirty politics, many Americans like that. You'll be back. Time will tell. Despite all the bad press, outdated rituals, and more serious criticisms of various monarchies, there remains an enduring, insatiable public fascination with these untouchable rulers. Being a royalist doesn't really tie in with everything that I sort of am and believe, um, but I do think they're incredible people. The relatable royal character is our window into that world, even if, at the end of the day, they're really nothing like us. In here, it's better if we're equals. If we were equals, I wouldn't 
being here. Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. I'm Deborah, And we're the creators of The Take. Please subscribe and tell us what you want our take on next. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community that offers affordable classes designed to fit your schedule and your skill level. With Skillshare, you can discover creative, entertaining workshops that help to break up the monotony of a day spent inside. One Skillshare staff pick you can check out right now is Amaryllis Henderson's class on maintaining a daily artistic practice. Amaryllis' class is filled with down-to-earth tips on how to incorporate a 100-day sketchbook challenge into your already busy life. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey.